We thank you for taking the time to be with us at C3. We hope you enjoy today's message. It's that time of year when people are making their way back to the church, so we are glad that you are all with us this morning. If you have your Bibles, I want you to open them to the book of Exodus. We are on part 11 of our series uh, entitled Exodus. We are out of here. And this morning, we are looking at the part that's going to get them out of here, out of Egypt. Um, It was a day probably like any other day, which was a week really like no other week. It is a week that had become known as a week that is a feast, a feast of unleavened bread. The city of Jerusalem would have been packed Some estimate that well over 100,000 people or four times its normal population will have jam-packed into the streets. It had been a lengthy time in which Israel had now been dealing with occupation from a world power that was known as the Romans, who had overthrown the Greeks, who had overthrown the Persians, who were with the Medes, who had overthrown the Babylonians, and on and on, all the way back to the Egyptians. Israel had a history of being overrun and overpowered and overruled. On this particular instance, a man by the name of Jesus Christ would sit on a donkey and work his way into the city. The city was now full of both excitement as well as tension. People were wondering whether this man that had been healing people and growing limbs and hands, a man who, it was said, stopped a funeral and raised a a, a young boy from the dead, brought him back to life, a man, it was rumored, could walk on water, could stop with a word, a storm, and change the whole climate. Was this, in fact, the one that was prophesied would come to release and save Israel from its oppressors? Is this the one that had been told would come? On the other side, the Roman military, the Roman government, they were very tense, they were very nervous, so they upped their guard. The governor was in town to make sure that both uh, order, justice was being handled. As people would move in and through the temple, Jesus would arrive into the city with chants that would rival a world idol as they, the people began to chant, save now, save now, save now save now, and the place was in an uproar. He would walk into a temple and clear out money changers and those who had changed the way the worship system was was operating and the obstacle to people connecting with their God. Throughout that week, preparations would be made for what had become known as the Passover. This would be the 1400th time that this Passover would be celebrated. Jesus would gather the apostles around the table with the cups of wine, with the bread, with the lamb, with the herbs, and he would be there as the head of household functioning in the role to preside over family. This was something that was done over and over again and over and over again as a reminder to Israel that there is a God that is for you, not against you, and a God that will rescue and save you and will judge your oppressors. To go all the way back now into the original, the first time that Passover was started, we look at the book of Exodus. Now, up until this point, to catch you up in case you're new, it's been 430 years since they first arrived in Egypt. 
a small family from the, the extended family of Jacob. Joseph had arrived. Joseph was uh, elevated to a great position, as you know. Joseph rescues his brothers, his, fa his, his father's family as a result of a famine. They come, they are given the land of Goshen. This little family of 70 people grows into thousands. They estimate at this time there are about 600,000 men plus women plus children or estimated 1.25 million people that had made up the, the nation of Israel. And it had become a perfect place of incubation for them to grow and it was now time for them to leave to go to the promised land. However, there were pharaohs that had arisen that did not know of Joseph and this one in particular that we read about. And he was not impressed with Israel as a nation. Matter of fact, was a little fearful that they would turn on Egypt if there was an ever attack and would join those that were the enemy. And so they decided to enslave them and to make them to do the labor of building pyramids and roads and canal systems and, and everything. They became the labor force for Egypt. Moses is called by God to deliver Pharaoh a message. And the message is pretty simple. Let my people go. It's time for them to be a free people so that they can come to the place of promise and they can worship me. That they can be my people and I can be their God. And the gods that are here in this land really are no gods at all. All they are is, is symbols and, and uh, formed aspects, pictures of animals that really are no gods at all. However, Pharaoh is not impressed and says to Moses, I neither know your God nor will I listen to your God. So your people will not leave. And over and over again, Moses and Pharaoh together with God overseeing all this, are involved in a power struggle over simply, it's time for us to go. No, you won't go. It's time for us to be free. No, you won't be free. I am the Lord. There is no other. I have no idea who you are, nor will I listen to you. Your people are staying put. And so plague after plague after plague is falling upon Israel as God will very slowly turn the heat up the heat of judgment, as well as freedom on the land of Egypt. They don't seem to be paying much attention as the magicians can duplicate some of the early uh, miracles that are being performed by God through Moses and Aaron. And then all of a sudden, they can't be repeated anymore, and the people of Egypt start looking at Moses and Aaron and begin to follow their God. And people of Egypt are now beginning to look and discover that the gods of Egypt really are no gods, and the gods of the Hebrew, that God is in fact the one and only true God. However, Pharaoh, his heart grows harder, his neck grows stiffer, he digs his heels in a little deeper. He will not release people to be free. He refuses to allow people to be exactly what God has called them to be, free, free. Worshiping, literally meaning there is this aspect that we were created for to declare the worth of God and to give him honor, to receive the promises that come from him uh, to us. He stands in the way as an obstacle for that and says, I will be the one that provides for you. I will be the one that controls your life, good, bad, and different. And so we come to the last plague this morning. And it is a plague that will befall the entire boundaries of Egypt. And Moses now will alert the people of Israel what to do because God is going to pass over. And so watch what happens as this will be instituted. And then we'll draw some conclusions as what happens with Jesus and what this means for us this morning. But beginning in verse 1, it says, Now the Lord says to Moses and to Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be the beginning of months for you, for it is the first month of the year for you. Now speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month 
Each one of you is to take a lamb for themselves according to their father's household, a lamb for each household. Let's stop there. Because the first thing that we find right here is that Passover is going to change a lot of things. The first thing it's going to change, it's going to change the calendar for people. That now what God says is this event that's going to take place is going to be so important that it is now going to be your new year. This is how your year will start. Instead of January 1st, like us for New Year's, where there's great celebration, the new year for you will be this event. You will always remember, and this is going to flip the entire script that you have been operating over. The beginning of your new year will be April, and it will center right around this event that's going to take place. You will always remember on this time frame what God has done for you, that he saw and heard your cry, and he is going to bring you out. Every time the new year starts, it is to start with this. This will be a feast that will go on for a week long. This is like the the, the New Year's Day, um, July 4th, kind of all put together in one week, bookended by, by assemblies. It's a blowout party as a, a way of constantly remembering what God has done. For 1,400 years, they have been undertaking this, the beginning of their new year, to remember, to be reminded, to to celebrate what God is going to do. We continue, and we find that, that there are some things that are supposed to happen as this, this memory is supposed to be focused in on. You're supposed to remember all of this because Passover is going to not only change your calendar, but it's also going to do something different. It's going to change your identity. You're no longer going to be known as Hebrew slaves. You're going to be known as the nation of Israel. You're going to be known as God's people. You're going to be known as free. You're going to be known as the people of promise. You're going to be known as the people in whom God is personally moving with, working through, changing time frames, changing seasons. He is driving out the things of this world. He is throwing off evil. He is establishing you as his people. Everything right here will change your identity. You're not going to walk around all filthy, dirty, with torn rags as clothes. You're going to be the people of God. You're going to be able to walk with your head up. People are now going to fear you when they see you as one nation. It is time now to be known by the world as I have known you, as my sons and my daughters. So this event will change their identity. The fact that that this event is going to be so specific because death is going to visit every single solitary house of the nation of, of Egypt. And so every household will have death coming to it. Death will visit it. But as the people of God, you have a choice get a chance to choose a substitute. And so what God will tell Moses is, this is the substitute for you. I want you to always remember the substitute. I want you to understand that there is one that is going to step in the place for you. And so he's going to tell them all about how the substitute works so that when Jesus Christ walks in, they will obviously be able to identify the person as the substitute. Watch how this works. Beginning now in in verse 3. He's going to give us six things that we are to remember and for Israel to do regarding this substitute. He says, Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth day of the month, each one is to take a lamb for themselves according to their father's household. A lamb for each household. Now, if the household is too small for a lamb, then he is to get his neighbor nearest to his house and to take one according to the number of persons in them, according to what each man should eat. You're to divide the lamb. Your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old, and you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month, 
than the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the house in which they are to eat it. They shall eat the flesh that same night, roasted with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and, unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but rather roasted with fire, both its head, its legs, along with its insides. And you shall not leave any of it over until morning, but whatever is left over morning, you got to burn it with fire. Now you shall eat it in this manner with your... Uh, with your robes tucked in, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live, and when I see the blood, I'll pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Now this will be a memorial to you, and you shall celebrate as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. So seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, but on the first day you shall remove leaven from your house. For whoever eats anything leavened from the first day until the seventh, that person shall be cut off from Israel. Let's stop there. Six things that they're supposed to do in regards to prepare for this evening. Moses was told, call all the elders together and tell them this. This is what we've got to do. Because today is the day. Today is the day of your salvation, as the Bible would say. This is what you need to remember, and this is what you have to do over and over and over and over again. The first thing, the substitute itself had to be pure, had to be a lamb or a goat, had to be a year old without defect. So here's the thing that he's saying. Look, I want you to have something that is the very best of your flock. It's got to cost you something. It can't be just the one that is, you know, the, the one-year-old, it was the run of the litter, it's it's kind of deformed, decrepit. It's, if there is such a thing as an ugly lamb or ugly goat, it's gotta, it can't be that one. It's got to be the purest. It's got to be the best. It's got to be without blemish because God will be giving his best to you. This is going to cost God something. There is a cost. The substitute comes with a cost, guys. And so right from the very beginning... There has to be a cost. It's got to be the best. Goes against the grain of everything. He says, so what I want you to do is to get this, this pure animal. Now, there's nothing pure about the animal. If you've ever been to the petting zoo, people will be pretty much in agreement. Goats and lambs stink. <laughs> they smell. You pet them. You got to go wash your hands as soon as you come out of the petting zoo. They're a smelly funky little animal. They breathe on you. They, they make messes half the time while you're in there. That, that's not what's pure. What's pure is what the, the substitute will represent 1,400 years from this day. That's what's pure. So he is saying, here's the picture of purity. Unblemished, has to be pure. That's what we have to do. There has to be a cost of something that will happen for you. Secondly, the substitute, according to verse 6, has got to be personal. How about this? On the 10th day, go grab the lamb or goat. Bring them into your house. You ever bring in a little animal to your kids? Four days. Your kids and you are going to feed that animal. You're going to clean up after its messes. It's going to run through your house. It's going to become part of your family. All of a sudden, four days later, you got to kill this thing. Try to take an animal away from a kid and go kill it, and the kid had to be a part of it. So guess what happens with this? This puts a personal aspect on what this really means when it comes to a substitute for us. Third, the substitute has to be killed, according to verse 6. It has to be roasted over fire. 
So you and your family, together, you grab the little lamb. Uh, you grab the goat. You don't break its neck. You grab it by the head, and the father would take a knife and would slit his throat, and blood would come gushing out everywhere, and you're collecting it in a bowl. You skin the animal together as a family. Kids are crying. You're feeling like, what did I, you know, as a parent, you're like a heel. You're dragging this thing in, and then you got to put it on the fire. You can't boil it in water. Jimmy and Susie, and Sally and Bobby, they're all standing there, and you got the goat on the spit in the fire. And the fire was, is to be by the father or the head of the household as a reminder to all that fire represents that God's presence is here, but so is his judgment. That this house has to make a choice. We've got to make a choice for a substitute or we've got to make a choice for death. We choose right now. God is giving us the choice to let the, the lamb be the judgment or let us be the judgment. And little Jimmy and little Sally and Bobby and Susie are all, that sounds pretty good to me. And then not only does this thing have to be killed and roasted, but then the, the blood that was collected, usually in a, in, a, in a potted vessel. The family would walk outside, and the father would take a, a hyssop branch, which is a very stiff kind of a, a, a plant, and it had like fuzzy, like pussy willow type ends to it, and you would dip it, and you would put it on the doorposts, and you would put it across the lintel, and the blood, obviously, was not to be sprinkled. It was to be applied. And when it would be applied, it would run. And on where the lintel met the, met the doorpost, guess what it would form? It would form a cross. A cross in blood. That would point forward 1,400 years. That not one person would really understand other than this. Is that the blood has to be personally applied. You could have the pure goat, you could have killed the goat, you could have roasted the goat, but if you just looked at the blood and said, now this is what the blood represents, and let me tell you about the blood and what the blood means, and we're going to have faith that the blood is going to do this, if you don't apply it, it does you absolutely no good, and when the death angel would come, all the firstborn in your family would die. Faith without action, the Bible says, is what? Dead. Dead. This isn't something right here where we have faith in something. This is I take faith and I put it into practice, always reminding Israel and reminding us this morning that if I know the truth and I don't apply the truth to myself personally, the truth does me no good and puts me in a place of destruction or judgment. Always a reminder constantly a reminder. So it had to be applied. The author of Hebrews reminds us this in chapter 9, verse 22, that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. There has to be a payment for the sin of mankind against God. Falling short, as the Bible would say, we have missed, we've fallen short of his glory. We are not in of ourselves under the order of Adam fully human. We don't fully reflect God's glory apart from sin being purified from our life. Because not only does sin destroy, but sin tarnishes the image. And it gives a false image in the way that the gods of Egypt were giving a false sense of what a godlike deity is. And so the blood was really important and you had to do it and always rem re remember every time you walked in and out of that house at twilight when you're doing this, that it's the blood that the angel's going to see. It's the blood that's going to save. It's the blood that's going to rescue. It's there's something with the blood that's going to cause God to pass over our house. Fifth, verses 8 through 10 tell us 
that the substitute has to be completely consumed. Anybody that would have gone to Tobago can tell you that when you eat goat, it is chewy, and so you don't want more than you can handle. So here's the deal. Whatever size goat, you had to eat it all. And so you, you, you stick a goat or a lamb in your mouth, and you're just... Chewing. And so, if you have a small family, you were to invite the neighbors over for dinner. One lamb had to be consumed, all of it. Had to eat it, and if by chance there was any left over, you had to burn it. So here's the deal. It reminds Israel that the provision from God is new each and every day. There is nothing to store up. When it comes to God, you consume everything that is of him. Parts of the lamb and goat aren't necessarily the best tasting. I'll leave that to your imagination. When we come into a relationship with God through Christ, not everything we read in the Bible that involves a life with Christ is appealing. You have to consume it all. Good, bad, indifferent. It is the amen or no amen part of obedience. There are a lot of parts of this walk with Christ that are a no amen. Don't like. Don't like. We're to consume it all. It's part of what comes with the substitute for us. And then finally, sixth, it had to be eaten in haste. And that's what verses 11 through 14 are talking about. Now, this is where faith steps in. Because on the first Passover, they have no idea what this means. Kill a lamb, roast it, spread some blood. God's going to pass over. People are going to die. And so if you want to make sure the firstborn in your family doesn't die, then this is what you have to do, and then you're going to be out of here. So you have to be dressed and ready Because once this thing is eaten, once it's burned, all of that, the cry is going to come. You're going to line up and out you're going to go. And what God had said in the very beginning is all of you all day long should have been asking your neighbors for silver and gold, and you're going to plunder Egypt this way, and Egypt's going to tell you, get out of here. So you got to be ready to go. Got to be packed and ready. This is a packed light. All you're doing is putting your clothes on. Got your staff in your hand. Kids are all there. Everybody is sitting there. And out you go. There's a faith to all that because they have no idea what that looks like. And when you do the study on this, the firstborn means the firstborn of every member of your family. So if your grandfather, your father, and a son was there, there's going to be three people who are going to die if they're the firstborn from that generation. This isn't just one. That's why all over Egypt when you read from Pharaoh, Pharaoh to, the, to the nobles, to the magicians, to the common people. There was people dying left and right. And so there's this huge outcry that's going. And so God wanted them to know you've got to be ready, ready to go. Because Passover is changed because of the, subst- of the substitute. The calendar has changed. The identity has changed. Next got to remember this. Passover changes the narrative. Up until this point, guys, Egypt was the world power. Everything was running through Egypt. Israel was the bottom rung on the ladder. They were the thing that everybody stepped on. And so what was supposed to uh, be included in this was an unbelievable celebration. Because you went, you go from low rung to top rung that quick because of God's substitute. Look what happens in verses 15 through 20. He says, here's, here's what you're supposed to do. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. But on the first day you shall remove leaven from your house, and whoever eats anything leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off. So there's this massive celebration. However, there is something you're supposed to remember at the beginning of each year. 
You're supposed to remember that God has rescued you, that God has saved you. And so in order to do that, you would, in all of the bread, you would remove the yeast from it. And the yeast is something that works through the bread and causes the bread to rise, right? So without yeast, what you get is this this very thin, snappy, what's called matzah. And so if you ever snap a matzah, you can hear it, and you'll hear that kind of similar sound on... uh, on Communion Sunday, when everyone breaks the host, you hear that snap to it. It's without yeast. It's in the purest form. And so during this beginning part, what Passover was meant to do in the narrative was it was like a, it was like a yearly do-over for Israel. They were to de-yeast themselves, if you will, of whatever it is that contaminates their life. So the father would get everyone around and, and they, would, they would have this, this, this functioning on the Passover. But all week long, there would be this reflection on what is it in my life that needs to be removed? See, it causes us that same thing to go, what is it in my life that if truth be told, I really wouldn't want this to be told in front of the community of believers. That's what gets removed. Is it an attitude? Is it um, something that's habitual? Is it something relational? Is there there something that we get in our life that's working itself into us and very slowly eating away at us? See, every year they had like this, this, this great reminder that God is a God that is not only with you but for you. And because of the substitute, he gives you a do-over. So every year, you're going to get a little bit sullied from this world, aren't you? You're going to get a little dirty from this world. When you take the yeast out, it's a reminder of what repentance does to us. To say, okay, on this particular year, I may have blown it, but now I'm going to remove that and I'm going to come back and I'm going to be, be reminded of God's great salvation of his great forgiveness, of his great restoration, that God is for me. Jesus would say this in the New Testament. He would remind people at the washing of the feet that not all of you gets dirty, just your feet from walking in this world. John the apostle would grab this and say, it's the blood of Jesus that continues to cleanse us of our sin. The if you confess your sins to the church... God is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you from all your yeast. It removes it so that you don't walk around as people who feel somewhat low-rung, somewhat shameful, somewhat uh, of a disappointment to God, somewhat of a disappointment to people, somewhat of a a broken individual who has to lash out in order to protect. You don't need to protect anything because God has you in the hand. And every year in April, Israel would be reminded to take that out, to remove what it is that's working itself through your body because ultimately it will destroy you. It gives us a whole completely different understanding of God's grace. God looks at us and sees us in Christ, just like he will see Israel in Christ 1,400 years before Christ really comes. It's phenomenal how good God really is and how much God really is for us. And then skip over to verse 26 and 27 of chapter 12, because this is something the head of household was instructed to do. Maybe something that has gotten lost a little bit in, inside the church settings. Because part of what happens, it has happened for, was happening every year, 1,400 years, and, and, and where Jesus will step in, is the head of household was operating all the aspects of this. He was directing everything. Now it would start as they were about to eat. Usually the mom would kind of 
take the, the oldest son, the firstborn son, because he was the one that was going to be potentially outed, if you will. And she would take him during the day and say, okay, dad's going to look at you. And when he looks at you, this is what you're supposed to say. You're supposed to look and say, Father, what makes this night so different than all the other nights? Okay? So if you get panicky, just look at me and I'll, I'll, I'll give you the nod. So they would gather around the table. And verse 26 would happen. God says to Moses to tell the elders, always remember that when your children say to you, what does this right mean? What makes this night so different? You shall say, it's the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the sun, over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt, and he smote. Smote's never a good word, by the way. Smite and smote. When you see those, nothing good comes of smiting and smoting. He, he literally goes through Egypt, but he spared our homes. And then all the people, the whole family, would bow their head, and they would give God thanks. Imagine this for a week long. And in the middle of this, this little kid, little Johnny, is standing there. He's all dressed and ready. You know, and, and as years would go on, this would take on the name Seder. And, and, and they're, they're, they're there, and, and the father would be there, and he would look, and, and the little kid would look and go, okay, this is on me, this is on me, and mom would go, okay, do we rehearsed. Daddy, what makes this night different than all the rest? And then the father would stand there. Let's go forward 1,400 years. Because presiding over the Passover is the head of household, Jesus Christ. Jesus is not only going to participate in the Passover, but he's going to change the Passover. He's going to change the calendar. He's going to change the identity. He's going to change the times, the seasons. Everything now is going to be focused on him. And so he stands there as the head of household. And the question would come from one of the disciples. My guess would be probably from John, who would say, what makes this night different than all the rest? And instead of Jesus pouring out the four cups of wine that would speak of all that was happening, all the pain, all the sacrifice, he would now take a cup and he wouldn't pour it out. He would say, this is the cup of a new covenant in my blood. And now as often as you drink this, as often as you eat this, you're no longer remembering a lamb substitute. You are remembering the substitute. And everything changes. You know how great this is? Think about this. Jesus Christ is so amazing when he flips this that the calendar doesn't just start with April. He changes the entire history of time before Christ and after Christ. He's the central figure. Think about this. No other person has affected human history so much so as Jesus Christ that he would become a common curse word. How important is that? You don't go, oh. When Jesus Christ's name is either cursed or praised, it's an acknowledgment that this is somebody really important. You never think about that when you hear people swear, when you hear people curse. It's the most powerful word, powerful name in all human history that even the non-believer would invoke it. Invoke him. It's a recognition of how great God really is. What makes this night so different, Jesus Christ would say, is that my body 
and my blood are going to be given up for you. That whoever believes and chooses the substitute, judgment will pass over your life. And you will have the life that I give. You will have freedom and identity. And you will now no longer be known as a slave or a commoner in this world. But you will be known as a son and a daughter of Almighty God. Phenomenal aspect of all of this and how this works. And so the sons of Israel have a choice. Do they go and do it? Verse 28, they go and they did so, just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. And now it came about at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of the cattle. Pharaoh arose in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt for there was no home where there was not someone dead. Then he calls Moses and Aaron. Calls, calls him in the middle of the night and says, rise up and get out of my country. You and your kids and your flocks and everything, leave. Just get up and go. And go worship the Lord as you have said. Take your flocks, take your herds, and go. And then he says this, and bless me also. We'll talk more about that next week and why that is so important and what, what it really means. So the Egyptians then begin to urge the people to send them out of the land. And they said, look, we got to get rid of these people or we're all going to be dead. There's people dropping like flies left and left and right all around us. Everybody's dying. We've got to get them out of here. And so Israel lines up by clan, by family, by tribe, and out they go. And 1.2 million people will be in a line with all of their stuff heading out with all kind of wealth that only God could have orchestrated. Next week, we'll pick up on that. But this morning, we need to take a look at what this really, really means for us. Because when you, when you choose the substitute, two things happen. You don't get what you deserve. How many people know that what we deserve is what Egypt got? Okay? There was no recognition of God. They wanted to do their own thing their own way. Most uh, Pharaoh himself believed he was a god. They had gods for everything. They were all false but there was a, a significant amount of Egyptians, as you will find in the stories that progresses, that join Israel and walk out with them saying, you know what, we've discovered the real God. You know, and, and, and that will be a lot of our focus next week is who are we taking with us? Because they estimate that there were about three million to two, two and a half to three million people that walk out of there, and they, they, they weren't all Israeli people. They were a lot of Egyptian people who noticed and took notice and saw it and said, I want what's real. I want the promise. I'm, I'm journeying with them. So we don't get what we deserve. But we also get what we don't deserve, which is grace. We get grace. We get God's favor through the substitute. The substitute becomes the most important thing in Israel's history and in our faith. Because with the substitute comes God's goodness. It leads us to God's promises. It establishes God as the ruler of our homes, of our families. It gives us a God that we can go to at any point in time to say, this is what I'm dealing with. And I acknowledge who you are, and I am a son, I am a daughter. Jesus himself would remind us, when you ask your father, your earthly father, you ask him for a, a fish, is he going to give you a stone? When, when you're looking for, for a piece of food, he's not going to throw you a snake. That's not how, that's not how we do. We give our kids, we, we attempt to give our kids the best. How much more so would God in giving 
his best through his son so that we can participate in his best. Times change, but God never does. The same God on the first Passover is actively moving over each and every house, rescuing, is the same God that 1,400 years in the person of Jesus Christ is rescuing all people of all time, is the same God that stands and walks over here into 2018 on September 9th and says, I am here for you. The only thing that we have to understand is no matter which way we look at it, there has to be a payment and there has to be a death. The payment for sin is death. There has to be that. But there's always a substitute. And the application is you have to take ownership and invite the substitute. You have to choose the substitute. You have to understand that the substitute is pure. You have to, you have to make sure that the substitute, Jesus Christ, becomes personal. You have to understand that the, the substitute was killed and you were a part and parcel to it. You were right there. Whether you and your dad held the knife together on the lamb, or whether you were in the crowd shelling, cru shouting crucify him, or whether or not you were, you were doing something 2,000 years later that was so against God. All of us are guilty one way or another for killing the substitute, but the best part is the blood gets to be applied. You get to consume all that it is. And you get to join the journey into the place of promise when one day God will come back and restore all of this and set up his rule in a new heaven and a new earth. And you get to be a part of it, irregardless of what you have done, what you have blown, how you feel about yourself, how other fe people feel about you, what you're dealing with. God sees you as a direct reflection of the perfect man ever born, which is Jesus Christ. That's what we're in line for. So there has to be a death. So the question then becomes, are you going to choose the substitute? Or are you going to choose judgment? All of us have that ongoing. And then secondly, if you've already done that, what are you doing with the leaven in your life? Do you take a point in time to de-yeast your life? Because really that's what we do as a church. You know, we always are in that place of looking and evaluating and saying, what is it that needs to be removed from my life? And when you give it to God, the celebration is enhanced. Amen? So let's stand this morning. The Bible says that there is no other name first church in the book of Acts. The Apostle Peter says, there is no other name that's given to men under, under heaven in which we must be saved. There's no other substitute, guys. Nothing. Except through Jesus Christ. There is no magical formula. There is, there is nothing, no one, that can bring us eternal life. God knows us intimately because he's created us. There's not a prayer that you need to repeat. There's a heart and life that you need to give. There is something that we all need to submit to, and that is that there is one greater than us. And what I understand is that my sin puts me in a place of God's fire. What the substitute does is it puts me in a position of God's presence. When I choose the substitute and say, Lord, my sin, I want it to be counted with the substitute. And I want my life to be counted in his life. So I invite his life into my life. That's what salvation brings. Repentance is the journey of the ongoing yearly, weekly, maybe daily de-yeasting of all the stuff that's rising in your life. And so whether you're in a place where you're inviting Christ into your life for the first time or you're inviting the Holy Spirit to remove something 
that is defiling the life of Christ in you and destroying your life. He's here this morning. So let's pray. Well, Father, we thank you. We thank you that you're a God that has shown us that you pass over us in order to rescue us. That you are the one and only true God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that, Lord, you ask, most importantly, that we would love you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. Lord, that's what the Passover, the substitute, is all about. You loving us and us loving you. We thank you that you're also a God that forgives, as we're reminded that Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. That, Lord, you take our sin and you completely remove it and you restore what's been damaged. Nothing, no one else can do that but you. And so, Father, we thank you this morning that we are people that are on a journey moving towards the place of promise. And that, Lord, you have a plan for each and every one of us. And you will lead us. You will protect us. You guide us. You provide for us whatever is needed because we are your children. So, Father, we thank you. And, Lord, as we go, we're asking that you would bless us this morning. And so, Father... May you bless us, each one of us. May you keep us. May you cause your face to shine upon us. May you continue to be gracious to us, not only today, but throughout this day, this week, until you bring us back next week as we watch Israel leave a life of oppression and begin a journey into a life of promise, a life of hope, a life of vision, a life full of promise. So, Lord, we thank you for that, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.